We're going to start the panelists, and I will introduce them. First, my friend and neighbor, and one of the most socially responsible business leaders in America, and one of the most creative, the chairman and CEO of Kenneth Cole Productions, Kenneth Cole. Second, the founder of Women for Women International, who will tell you the remarkable story of where they started and where they are now, a writer and producer, Zainab Salbi. Third, St. Louis native, co-founder and CEO of Square Inc., co-founder and executive chairman of Twitter, Jack Dorsey. And finally, the inventor and writer of Moving Windmills, a student at Dartmouth College, a native of Malawi, who became rather famous for those of us who read The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, for making a windmill from spare parts and scrap that generated electricity based on an image that he saw in a book, William Kamkawamba. So thank you first for agreeing to be on the panel. I want to, uh, first I want to make sure I give you a chance to say whatever you want to say. But I do think it would be interesting for all these students here who have, have already or are now in the process of promising to do something, something you have all once done whether you promised yourself you'd build a windmill when no one thought you could, or you started uh, trying to help women in difficult circumstances, and you went from a few thousand to hundreds of thousands, or you started a little company that turned into a big company and became one of the major forces in the battle against AIDS worldwide, or you gave us an unprecedented way of talking to each other in a way that is sometimes embarrassing for all who participate, <laughs> but undeniably empowering. So what I want to do is give you a chance first to say, how did you decide that your dream was what it turned out to be? How did you get the job then? And tell them what, if any, obstacle lay in your way. We'll start with you. Um, so um, when I was growing up, I grew up in a small village in Malawi. Uh, pretty much most of the people are farmers, including my parents. So um, farming can be really like, difficult. So one, one year, we experienced some drought, and as the results, most of the farmers, they didn't harvest enough food, including my family. So because of the situation, my parents didn't have money to pay for my education. So I was forced to drop out of school. So when I had to drop out of school, I looked at my father and I wanted to continue with my studies because I thought that if I can be, I can get more education, then I can be able to do whatever I want to do with my life. So at that time, I decided to go to the library to start reading books. So I found this book which had the pictures of the windmill in the cover. When I opened inside, they say windmill could pump water and generate electricity. The word pump water attracted my attention. I say, if I can be able to build this windmill to pump water, then it means that I can start irrigation and I can grow food two to three times a year instead of only one time during the land season. So for me, for that, it was more of like, 
it was a solution towards the problem that we are facing that time. So I decided to build um, my build the windmill that would pump water. But at that time, a lot of people were doubting at me. What really encouraged me to do it was that once I saw that picture in the book, I said that if that picture existed, this windmill existed somewhere else, it means that actually somebody built it. So there's nothing that they can stop me from doing the same thing. I can be able to, to do it. So regardless of what people were saying, I didn't stop from doing what I wanted to do because I trusted myself that I can, I can do it and I've seen the picture. And also at the same time, when I was collecting all the materials to, to build the windmill, a lot of people were laughing at me somewhere like, maybe you're going crazy. Somewhere I may be saying that maybe you are smoking weed. Uh, I remember my mom, she was so worried of me. She was like, you are no longer going to find a wife. No one wants to marry a crazy man. Any anyway. Anyway, but I think what really like, encouraged me that I had like, uh, I trusted myself, I believed in myself that I can do it if other people have done it before. There's nothing that they can stop me. So I think that's what really encouraged me to do it. You know, at, at a time when we sometimes take for granted the fact that an eight-year-old on the internet can find things out. In 30 seconds, I had to go to university to learn. It's important not to forget how many people there are out there who are still isolated from that world. And as we try to overcome that isolation, we should never forget the power of a book and a picture. The power of one picture to trigger. He's probably got six or seven hundred new neural networks in his brain now because of that one picture he saw. Good for you. So, <laughs> Zainab, tell him your story. How did you do what you did? And tell him what Women for Women did in its first year and what it's doing this year. Well, I believe that the world we live in is a product of our imagination. So we might as well claim our imagination. And all what it takes to reclaim our imagination is what you just said, is believing in ourselves and believing that we can do it, I can do it. For me, the turning point, I was 23 years old. I was a new immigrant in the United States. I'm from Iraq. It was not an easy journey to come here. Um, and I was going back to school, and I, it was for the first time read about the Holocaust. And in that same month, there were front pages, the cover pages of Newsweek and Time magazine about, about the concentration camps and the rape camps in Bosnia. And it was a 23-year-old putting it together saying, but we said never again, and it's happening again. And nothing, I knew nothing about Bosnia, I knew nothing of who are these people, their language, their culture, nothing, I had no connection, but I knew that there was an injustice. And that unlike in, in, and I was living in a country that allowed me to act and I had the responsibility to act. And that's how it started, really. Now at the time, that was 1993, there were no websites, there were yellow pages. Um, and I just called the women's organizations at the time and I, and it's a long journey and I had the exact same thing of people saying, you're crazy, go get yourself a job, go do something useful, what are you trying to do, Mother Teresa? Kept on saying I have a better fashion sense than Mother Teresa, but, but the point is, every, there was no support. And what I realized that there took two things. It took believe in myself, that I really needed to trust that I can do it. And it took a belief of some, at least one other person. In my case, it was my former husband and the co-founder of Women for Women International, who also believed in the possibilities. In 1993, I distributed eight to 33 women, it's still the same program where I ask every single person around the world to sponsor one woman survivor of war at a time by sending her $30 a month and exchanging pictures and letters with her. And in September 1993, I distributed to 33 Bosnian and Croatian women in refugee camps. I spent my birthday in buses and distributing money and, and letters and pictures. Um, in three months, 
the, it, we will celebrate the 20th anniversary of Women for Women International. And we have helped, <laughs> and we helped 3,300,000 3, women in eight countries and distributed and distributed more than $100 million to them. It makes me, it honestly makes me believe that if I, a refugee from Iraq, at the time had been raped and impoverished and displaced my own country and a student, and if I can do it in a foreign country, then every single person can do it. I did not have privileges when I started this. So I really believe, and it's what it takes is a believe in yourself, and that's it, it's as simple as that. The world we live in is a product of our imagination, so might as well create the life that you want. And I'm doing it again 20 years later, doing the same journey again, now to the Middle East. Kenneth, when did you decide that your business career had to include your social passions? Was it in the beginning? Was it after you realized you weren't going to go broke? Was it at some later time? Because a lot of these young people here, when they get out of university, or they're going to go to work in, in the economy, but they still will have a conscience that they want to do something. So tell them how you managed to build such a major role for yourself and your company in the fight against AIDS. So I had, um, my company is actually 30 years old. I started it when I was 11. and. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's a very consuming business. It's a wonderful business. It's the fashion business. And, um, and I went through all these periods of self-reflection because to be successful in anything you do, public, private, for-profit, not-for-profit, you, it requires that you give so much of yourself and you make so many significant life compromises. And, but somehow it felt that you know, in one regard, I was, well, I'd say to myself, fashion is incredibly important because it is the single most defining thing in our days. You, people don't often get to know any more about you than how you present yourself. You are in full control. You can be who you want to be perceived to be. But then on the other hand, if you can't provide for your family and you're ill or you don't, you can't put food on the table, then it's not very important at all. So how could I make what I was doing important? How can I make it relevant? How can I ask of my associates to put in the same hour, the same commitment that I was? And, um, and it just needed to be about more than just kind of what we wear. And it needed to be about more than, it couldn't just be about what we stand in, but somehow it needed to be about what we stood for. Not just what we wear, but of what we were aware. And how, so you lo we looked around at that time in the early 80s, and there was this pervasive consciousness, and everybody was looking to get involved in something bigger than they were. For the most part, though, it was, it was hands across America. We are the world, live aid, world aid. And most of these were initiatives to, to, to support hunger in Ethiopia, believe it or not. And not unimportant, but so remote. But nobody wanted to talk about what was really critical, this dark cloud that was everywhere, and it was AIDS. Because if you spoke about AIDS in that time, stigma was so devastating, you would be perceived to be at risk, which meant you were either an uh, intravenous drug user, you were Haitian, or you were gay. Now, I was a single male designer, so I knew everybody would just assume that I was Haitian. <laughs> but, Maybe because I wasn't in, in these groups. I don't know what compelled me, but you so rarely get a chance to use your resources, stand up, say something that's really important at a time when few are. So at that time, I took my resources and we did that. And we spoke about the fact that nobody was speaking about AIDS. And then I believe that when you commit to a, a commercial enterprise or a social enterprise, you really have to commit to it. You can't 
do it part time because invariably it doesn't really resonate, it doesn't work, and you'll find you'll frustrate yourself and everything else. So I knew I had to join, I had to somehow truly get involved. So I joined the board of AMFAR, which was a brand new AIDS organization founded by these two extraordinary women, um, a Swiss scientist named Matilda Krim and a Hollywood icon, Elizabeth Taylor. And they were just forming this organization. So I agreed to join this board. And at the time, you couldn't, um, it was, we knew how AIDS was, how AIDS was contracted, we didn't know how to cure it. Not that different than relatively recently. And it was clean needle, safe sex. So I ran an ad of a picture, and, but it was illegal to advertise condoms. So I ran a picture anyway of a condom in a magazine, but I airbrushed off the words. So there was a chance you'd confuse it for a graduation hat. But <laughs> underneath it said, shoes are not the only thing we encourage you to wear. And then I joined the board of AMFAR, and we started the first needle exchange program in New York State because nobody else was doing it. And, um, and today, and then I was asked, I became chairman of AMFAR because it became, it became, it changed me in such a profound way, and it became such a big part of who I am. And the, what the brand is and what the company stands for, and the, all of our associates, I know so many of them come to us because of what we do, and, they, and it makes them feel good about what they do. And, um, and today, Amfar has, and I became chairman eight years ago, and Amfar today has gone on and has been part of the initial funding of four of the six drugs that are keeping people alive around the world. The initial funding that prevented mother to child transmission. And as, as well as the, a lot of the, the initial research that was used by this. Berlin doctor that saved the, the, that clinically cured the first person cured of AIDS recently, um, which has been an enormous breakthrough. But I, but I just also want to say nobody has been a bigger leader and a bigger model than the, the president himself with Chai and with what this organization has done, what the Clinton Initiative has done for so many people around the world. But it's been a privilege to be able to do this, and it has changed me, and it's a big, just, just who I am, and it's a big part of what I do. And what do you think the net impact has been on your business? I know it, it's made, you, know, you can't, I, I can't tell you that it, we sell more shoes or clothes because of it, but I know that people, that, but, and I, and I, but I know people feel better about connecting with the brand. And I think it makes us all feel better about what we do every day because we work hard and it's, you know, can't, be successful at anything unless you do. Well, let me ask you this. Can you say with some conviction that it hasn't hurt your company? I can tell you it hasn't hurt my company. <laughs> Listen, this is a very big deal. Did you see there was a story this week about uh, the Starbucks annual shareholders meeting, and a shareholder got up and jumped Howard Schultz about his support for gay marriage, and he said, well, I understand that, and you may want to sell your shares. They're up now, and you can make a profit. But this company stands for inclusion, and we are serving coffee in urban areas all over America and all over the world, and we want everybody to feel the same when they walk in our coffee shop. And so, and I say that because, and to be fair, we've had some companies take conservative positions, too, you know, and, and on social issues. But by and large, it's just the point I was trying to make earlier. I think about it every time I see you. You just can't be an alert, aware person in the world and realize, like, how you and I live in Westchester County, New York, and what everybody else is up against in the world and not have it affect what you do with your life. You just, it's very difficult to do. And so I wanted you to see this because you should remember this because most of you will not be full-time in an NGO. And you should continue to do public good as a private citizen. And thanks to Jack, you'll have 50, 11 ways to do it in ways that are mind-bending. I, I think it'd be interesting for all of us here I'd like to hear you talk a little about Square and how you got it, but if you could start by telling them how did you get the idea for Twitter, and then how did 
as Twitter went from, as I understand it, when you, you tweeted the first message about seven years ago, and there are now more than 400 million messages tweeted every day, and there are half a billion users. That's reasonable growth. Uh, <laughs> so how did you get the idea, and how did you personally morph into doing what you're doing with Square? What do you think the implications of that are for people like William? What if he wants to go back to Malawi, but be able to access modern technology and be able to do what he did on a scale basis for smallholder farmers? Yeah, the, um, the, the, the power of the picture and the power of the imagination really resonates with me because it's exactly how I started as well. My, my parents grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and what I love most about my parents is they always stuck by the city. They love the city. And I developed a love for the city as well. And I, my love manifested in an in, in, in obsession over maps. Um, and I, I loved maps. I loved looking at maps. I loved wondering what was happening in this particular intersection, what was happening over, over there, and um, all the, the transfer between all the streets, and, and just what was happening in the world, uh, the world around me. And uh, my parents um, fortunately got me a computer when I was eight years old in 1984 as a Macintosh. And um, I fell in love. I fell in love with how one could change this picture, how one could move the map, how one could move the dots. And I resolved to do whatever it took to learn how to do that myself. Um, and eventually, when I, was, when I was about 14 or 15, I learned enough to do that. And Twitter is a, is a very, very long story. We, um, we started, uh, I, I started with an implementation in 2001, and uh, it was very simple. I wanted to go out into the world. I wanted to see uh, what was happening in the world, and I wanted to be anywhere I was, I could update uh, what I saw around me. And that was, that was the simple idea in 2001. And uh, it just wasn't the right time, and I didn't have the right team. So I put it on the shelf until 2006, when SMS got really big in this country. And uh, I just fell in love with the technology. I fell in love with the fact that it was pre-installed on every single device out there. And one of the design constraints of Twitter, the 140 characters, is not only because I believe constraint inspires creativity and allows people to be more of in the moment and of the moment, but also it works on every single device around the world. We could create a system where even with a $5 cell phone in the middle of Kenya, someone could participate in the same conversation that Justin Bieber was having in the United States of America. And in fact, talk with Justin Bieber in the United States of America. And, uh, and that was always in our intention. And we built the system in, in two weeks. And it was really about that feeling of what we wanted to see. And the biggest pushback we got was, why would anyone use this? This should not exist. No one needs it. No one needs to see what people are having for breakfast. And, and people <laughs> saw it as something that you updated what you're having for breakfast. And my response always was, you know, I tweet about what I'm having for breakfast, and most of the world could care less, and they see it as useless, and maybe so useless it's offensive. Uh, but there is one person that does care, and that's my mother. She <laughs> loves that I'm eating. She loves knowing that I'm alive. Uh, and she loves those tweets. And it really spoke to the power of the receiver, how we take these messages, how we take uh, what we see in the world, and we translate it into action, and we interpret it, and then we spread it to, to other folks. And one of my favorite quotes is by an author named William Gibson, uh, who wrote a lot of science fiction. And he said, the future has already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Right, which is an amazing thing to think about. The future has already arrived. It's already in this room, and your work is to distribute it. Your work is to spread it all around the world. And Twitter is a means to, to help do that. So I want to follow up and then come back to William for a question. So how did you move to Square? What do you, what do you think, what's the importance of Square? How is it going to work for people? 
Tell them a little about that. Square is a um, is a very simple idea. Another uh, another another vision, another picture that we wanted to see in the world. Uh, this one, my co-founder Jim McKelvey, who's also a St. Louis native and went to Wash U. He's an alum. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> It's good being in the hometown. Um, uh, he, uh, he's a glass artist, and he couldn't do a very simple thing, which is sell a piece of glass art because he couldn't accept credit cards for payment. And a lot of the world, uh, a lot of the United States specifically, is moving to plastic cards. They're not carrying cash anymore. They're not carrying uh, checkbooks. Um, and for an artist like him, uh, it's really meaningful that he can sell it right there. Um, other artists like him, uh, it's a choice between doing what you love and, and doing something that you have to do. And it's really simple when it comes down to just being able to accept a credit card. So we took a month and we figured out why, uh, why, why Jim couldn't accept a credit card. And we learned a bunch about the financial industry. Uh, the biggest complication for, for me in this case is I had no idea uh, about the financial world. I had no idea about credit cards. I had no idea about building hardware. Uh, but um, back to this point of conviction, uh, if you have a picture of where you want to go, if you have uh, a sense of what you want to see in the world, you fight like hell for it. And you do whatever it takes to make sure it exists. And you learn whatever you have to learn to do it. And once you feel it, and once you know it, then it resonates with, with other people. And, and Square uh, went in a very, very similar fashion. We started the company four years ago. Uh, with that idea of an individual being able to accept credit cards for whatever they do, anywhere they are, so they can participate in an electronic economy where the world is moving to. And then last year, we, uh, we signed up Starbucks, and we brought it to 7,000 stores. And what's most amazing about this is, just like Twitter, uh, the smallest of individuals can use it to participate in a global conversation in the same exact way th that the largest of largest organizations in the world can. So someone in the middle of Kenya can have the same conversation with the same tool that President Barack Obama is using on a daily basis. And with Square, an artist selling a piece of glass can use the same tool that Howard Schultz at Starbucks is using to run his business. It truly levels the playing field. And for both of these companies, both these technologies, it means that it's really not who you are or where you come from, but the merit of your idea. And the merit of your idea to resonate with people and to spread. And all you have to do is speak up. You know, uh, I think with, a, you know, this has enormous implications for the working poor people of the world. But when, uh, you know, I've been working in Haiti for three or four years now trying to help them, and 85% of the people of Haiti don't have a bank account. They were unbanked. There were big banks there, but since 20% of the country's income comes from expatriates in the United States and Canada and elsewhere sending money home, you can make all the money you want as a banker just charging a simple fee to convert the currency. But it's lousy for, you know, if you're a little guy and you want to start a business or have a loan. So we got a Canadian bank to offer base, Scotia Bank to offer basing banking services through a cell phone. It was the same idea. And it had a dramatic impact on how poor people perceive themselves and their potential. Also saved them a lot of money, sending money to when their kinfolk sent them money from Canada and the US. But but these things mean I think, and I wanted to ask you this, and then we'll kind of come back to some specific question I'll ask William. Do you believe that these empowering initiatives give places which seem light years <coughs> behind the West economically a chance to basically make up 100 years of development in a short time through sheer empowerment? Absolutely, and I, I think a lot of the innovations are happening outside the United States. You look at uh, Kenya and you look at M-Pesa uh, trading money with cell phones, um, which is a uh, much, much, much faster innovation than we've seen in the United States and, and, and really just this, this adoption. But I think, um, I think all these technologies serve to, to really focus uh, people's purpose and, and people's sense of, 
sense of self. And if, if you have that, if you have that, that strong sense of purpose, you have that conviction, uh, you, can, you can do anything. Um, and it's a little tiny tool that gives you that confidence to really focus on that purpose and, and keep asking the question why and why and why and why and go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper uh, to really build something that you want to see in the world. So, William, first of all, you didn't tell us, did your windmill work? And did you bring in two crops? And what are you going to do when you finish Dartmouth? Um, so, my windmill worked. Um, but... <laughs> so, so uh, when I was building, like, uh, when I came up with the idea of building windmill, at first I wanted to build a windmill that could pump water for... Um, for irrigation, but I end up building a windmill to generate electricity because at that time I couldn't find money to buy materials to build a water pump. But I had an idea how you're going to be able to generate electricity uh, because when I was much younger, I get really interested to learn how different things work. I remember asking people, how does the car work? As people tell me, you just put in gas and you start the engine, that's how it works. I'll be like, <laughs> Of course, I know you need to put in a gas, but how does that gas <laughs> turn the engine to land? No one could tell me. So one other thing that I was really like, curious was also like um, radio. I thought that inside the radio, there are like small, tiny people speaks. <laughs> one day, my parents went away. I was like, this is the time for me to say hi to the people <laughs> who speaks. When I opened that radio, I was so surprised to see very tiny stuff that looks like beans. I was like, ah, these people. Being a child, there was only one way to tell if they were people. I was like, I'm just going to pinch one of it a little hard. I was hoping that when it would feel like some pain, they would be like screaming, like, leave us alone. <laughs> that didn't happen. So because of that curiosity, I started like trying to remove one component after another, trying to notice what was happening. So when I remove one component, I find that maybe the uh, sound, the quality of the sound will drop or the volume will reduce. So from there, I was able to learn how to fix radios. So most of the time when I'm fixing radios, I was using the batteries. So when I saw the picture of the windmill that we're going to be able to generate electricity, and I also saw some diagrams in the book how electromagnetics work, that's when I, was, I came up with the idea of uh, building, the, um, building the windmill that generates power, and it was generating power to power my house and also for lights and also charging cell phones for people and the um, other power we're using to, to power radios so that we're going to be able to listen what is going on around the world. So what I'm planning to do right now after finishing up with my studies, I'm planning to go back to Malawi to see how well I can be able to use the knowledge that I'm getting through my, uh, my classes and through meeting people, interacting with people, to see how I can be use them to solve some of the problems that people are facing in my community. So that's my most like, um, interesting thing that I'm planning like, to do. Every summer I try to go back home to work in different projects. So uh, also this summer I'm going there to work in some of the projects that I've been working. Good for you. The, the reason we have some questions coming in via Twitter, we're going to take them. But the reason I ask you that question is that this all started out about how you could help your family farm. The world has 7 billion people. We're supposed to have 9 billion by 2050. There are already lots and lots of countries that have money and can't produce enough food to feed themselves. Saudi Arabia, China, there will be more. There is a, Africa has the largest amount of untilled arable land, and African farmers have taken good care of it by and large, uh, except around the deserts in the north where there's been desertification. By and large, the topsoil is intact. And there's a big fight going on, which technology can help to resolve in the right way, about whether the best thing to do is for Saudi Arabia 
to lease a million acres of Ethiopia at a dollar apiece to bring in all this mechanized farming and disrupt centuries and centuries of smallholder farmers, but grow the food, buy it, take it out. Or to build on the smallholder farmer network, which is the social and political eco structure of most of rural Africa, by simply giving them the things that our farmers have taken for granted for 80 years, for God's sakes. You know, just basically the opportunity to buy at competitive prices, seed and fertilizer, to store the food, and to get the food to market without having to pay half the price. In his country, a lot of farmers live down dirt roads where if you try to drive, it takes you an hour and a half to go 11 or 12 kilometers. And so these poor farmers that live down that road are having to pay half their annual income just to get the food to market. And I, I spent a lot of my life trying to stop that from happening, especially in Malawi. So I'll help you when you go home. But this is a big thing. That, that the importance of the windmill story to me is it shows again how dumb it would be for the wealthy countries of the world to go in and throw all these small farm holders off the land when they know it and can produce food and be productive and feed Africa and then export. I'm very worried about it. So you, just the act of your going home with the fame you've acquired from your, the, your story can be really important. And I'll do what I can to help you when you get there. Uh, so I want to, this is something any of the panelists can act on. Zach Trator, T-R-A-T-A-R, or Trator. What was the lowest emotional point you experienced when building your organization, and how did you overcome it? I'm happy to take it. But before I take it, I want to just comment a second about the farmers, because you know, 70% of the small farmers in the world are women. Mm -hmm. They produce 60% of the foods. <laughs> they own less than 1% of the land, and they earn less than 10% of the income. So if there is any investment that any of us can do in the future to make the world a better place, we need to invest in women and girls. Anyway, anyway, farming is one of them. Including technology, uh, really, if we want to solve our health issues, our environmental issues, our uh, poverty issues, uh, everything, my, in, in my opinion, investing in women and girls is the one point that it impacts everything else. But like, going back to the lowest points, I actually, oh gosh, I mean, you, when you're starting up, for every two steps forward, there is a step back, you know, there is, uh, in my case, the first three years of starting Women for Women, I was sending 100% of every single dollar raised to the women themselves, which meant that I had no money whatsoever, which meant I actually had to work and my former husband had to drop out of college so he can work as well, as well as we're going to school and doing Women for Women. And at one point, they, and the, but then in the journey, there are turning points. It's, you know, it's like any story that you read. Uh, there are turning points in the journeys, but they're not always progressing in a nice uh, way. Sometimes they are scary ways. In my case, I had no money whatsoever. And I actually remember there were a few turning points in, in my journey. One is at the age of 25, I got a call from the White House. And, from, uh, and I was told that President Clinton wants to honor you the eve before the Dayton Agreement for your work in Bosnia. Now, I had no money whatsoever. I actually don't know if I've ever told you the story. I had like a hole in my shoes. But I was so excited to be acknowledged by the President of the United States, and I'm only 25 years old, two years after I started Women for Women International. And that is a turning point and an opportunity. I am still emotional just thinking about it, which I am very, very grateful for. Because then it led to other opportunities, and it led other people paying attention to it. And then a year later, Again, I'm like exhausted because I had no money and I get a check in the mail for $67,000 from Working Assets. Working Assets is a credit card company and a phone company that donates $1 million of its profits to, I think, 36 organizations. And someone 
had heard about the work I'm doing after the press I got getting the award from you and nominated me to Working Assets. And I looked at that check and I was like, okay, thank you, God, I'm supposed to continue. But there is always a turning point. There are always times in which you doubt yourself. There are times in which you're taking a risk. It's sleeping out of the, you know, jumping uh, off the cliff sometimes. You're spending money that you're not sure if you're gonna make it, decisions that you're not sure that you have the experience about. What I learned in the process to trust my instinct and my gut, to listen to advice, always listen, and to be grateful because it's just it's a good world after all. I mean, I was an immigrant from Iraq and you gave me, an, you honored me in the White House, which I'm so grateful for. So you Thank keep you. on going. Cool. Kenneth, Jack, you want to answer that question or not? The lowest point when you started out? Answer the next one. That's good. <laughs> the, the first or the second one? I'll, I'll take either. Um, you know, the, well, the problem is in my business. Read the question. All right, I will. But I'm. I'm <laughs> you want to read the, the, In my business, you know, the, there are highs and lows every day. So it's, it's, and every day I'm coming to realizations, and every day I used to think my job years ago as a designer was to tell people what they should wear, and I learned quickly that my job was to know what they want and give it to them, but not how they expect it. So, and so there were all these realizations along the way, and there was all these ups and downs. And one day, every you know they love you, and next day they don't. And, and I have to clearly separate myself, the man from the brand. Otherwise, I can't go home at night and um, and hold my head up. But but I'd rather answer this question. So the the young okay, so going into corporate America after graduation, what are best ways to integrate corporate social responsibilities? So. You spoke about the Spruik Food before, and I have this, I, I'm really um, impassioned and committed to this notion of engaging and empowering this next generation of, 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 of uh, change agents. And I, if our, this fabric of our communities are, are in decay, and nobody questions that, and the question, and the reality is when we hire, we need to build buildings, we hire, builders of buildings, but to fix communities, we need community builders, and they don't exist, and you guys, if you guys become that, the world, is, there are none anywhere, and, and that, the great opportunities are so abundant um, beyond your imagination, and the ability to, to, to look and work across public and private sector opportunities, because they invariably don't speak to each other, for-profit and not-for-profit, because they often don't connect with each other. The ability to build proverbial bridges and take down walls is such an extraordinary opportunity. It's a challenge and it's an opportunity, and it is so incredibly rewarding. And the notion of committing yourself to service, which I believe you can't just say you're gonna do service when you have time. I believe you gotta embed it in what you do in the ordinary course, and it's not about the destination, it needs to be about the journey and you make it part of what you do every day, the journey is so much, the destination is so much more rewarding. And it's rewarding spiritually, culturally, and even financially, and that's okay. And that's a big change today. And it's okay if you, if you wanna make a lot of money and you do it while perform, performing and creating and providing some form of social good. And it's embedded today in all of our academic institutions and it's being taught by everybody. And, and, uh, and I just urge you to, in, embrace it, and, and, and there's so much that you can do with it. Um, Molly Gibson asked, how do we become more comfortable with our failures and what we learn from them? Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I, I think uh, what I love so much about this country is how much it embraces failure, how much it embraces mistakes and picking ourselves back up again and, uh, and, and doing it over again. And to Kenneth's point, um, every single day is a roller coaster, but that's why we do what we do. It's, it's a rush. Uh, you wake up in the morning feeling thrilled about what you're going to do. You get to work and you realize that uh, the world is going to end because of some new competitor or someone's leaving the company or something else is happening. And, and there's, there's nothing that can take that away. And then suddenly there's this glimmer of hope uh, in the next hour that brings you right back up. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, is just going back to that, that vision, going back to that purpose, going back to 
why we're all here, why we're here in this office, why we're all doing the same thing, why we're spending so many hours um, just working our hearts out to make sure that this thing exists in the world. And if you remember that, if you remember the purpose, if you remember the why, and you remember how precious and short life is, uh, you can do anything. And it reminds you to, to really focus and to really push and to look at a mistake as a learning opportunity, um, as something that you can rebound from and, and not react to, but use as, as, a, uh, as a waypoint on, on the map, on the, on the journey um, to push forward. So I always, uh, I always remind myself that I'm going to die and that uh, life is very short and we are here to bring this into the world and we have a significant vision and I'm a little bit impatient and I want it as soon as possible. So um, those two things really help me a lot. You know, um, I'm very competitive and I think losing is way overrated. <laughs> On the other hand, Life is a learning process, and one of the things I love about the non-governmental organization is you can try something, and you don't have to be afraid that you didn't hit your quarterly profit targets, or you don't have to be afraid you'll get voted out of office next time because you admitted you messed up. I, I think we need to create a culture where failure is okay as long as it's not the product of laziness. If it's the product of adventure, think how much further. Let's take William here. Now, you know, his story is working out pretty good now. He made the windmill work. But if he had never made the windmill work, he still would have been a smarter, wiser, abler person for having made the effort. I, uh, 38 years ago, 30, almost 39 years ago, I ran my first race for Congress, and I got beat. Then I got elected Attorney General. Then I was the youngest governor elected in America in 40 years. Then the Reagan juggernaut came along in 1980, and I got beat again. I'd already lost two races in the first five years. My prospects were low. I was the youngest former governor in American history. <laughs> People I had appointed to high office would cross the street to avoid being seen and shaking hands with me for fear that they would lose their political life. I know something about this. Uh, and here's what I want you to know about it. I'm the oldest guy on the stage here, so I want to tell you this. I will, in a few months, go to the, my 45th college reunion at Georgetown. And it is the only college class in the history of America to produce three elected presidents of three different countries the Philippines, El Salvador, and our country, and the man who ran the Saudi intelligence services for more than two decades. All one class, just a freak deal. But <laughs> we, but anyway, we've all been friends over all these years. Then next year, I'll have my 50th high school reunion. Here's what I want you to know for Ms. Gibson. The saddest people in my class are not those who have failed, including repeatedly. The saddest ones are those who never chase their dreams. So my answer is that there's as many answers to the question she asked about your failures and what did you learn from them. Think how many times, the first thing you learn is don't quit. That's what he had to keep doing this. He didn't know right away how to make the picture turn into the windmill. And the second best lesson I ever heard was from Nelson Mandela when I said, uh, Tell me the truth, didn't you really hate all those people, even though you let them come here and argue? <laughs> and uh, because we were friends, and he was very honest, he said, of course I did. <laughs> Until I realized they had already taken so much from me. I had been abused physically, I had been abused emotionally, I didn't, it destroyed my marriage, I didn't get to see my kids grow up. They had taken all this away, they, and I realized they could take everything except my mind and my heart. Those things I would have to give away. And he said, I decided not to give them away. And he looked at me and laughed. He said, neither should you. <laughs> and you think about it. Basically, if you're broken by defeat, 
you're giving someone else the permission to define your life and your worth and your tomorrows. You know, if you lost a bunch of yesterdays, welcome to the human race. But you don't have to give anybody your tomorrows. I think that's the most important thing to remember. Um, okay. The, Lisa Rutel asked, Jack says constraints inspire creativity. Can she wants a constraint? She wants each of the panelists to say in one word what drives you. One word. I believe. It's just my belief that it is absolutely possible to live in a better world and to make a world, the world a better place. Um, for me, I believe that I can do it if other people have done it, so I can be able like, to bring the change that will benefit pretty much anyone in the world, so I can be part of it. My one word. <laughs> you can change your outfit. <laughs> you can outfit change or both. Jack? My word would have to be the word why. It's, it's the thing that, that drives me. It's answering that question. It's, the easiest, uh, it's the easiest question to ask, but it's the hardest question to answer. Um, and if you keep asking that question, you keep getting down to an essence, and you get something that's truly, truly human. Now, this is a really a kind of an interesting question that I, I have no idea how to answer, but maybe you do. How would you advise small businesses to implement a social media strategy? How can they be active in the social media and how can they engage new and existing customers in things they care about? Um, with, with anyone with, with social media, it's really just being who you are. Um, so well, the, the biggest thing that this does is that it allows uh, one to really present a human face on everything that doing, they're doing. So whether it be the United States government or a major corporation or small business, if you use your own voice and you use your own uh, ideas and you just speak in a natural way, that'll engage people and, and that'll remind people that they're dealing with another human and it's a human that they want to work with. It's a human that they want to uh, trade with uh, and, uh, and transact with. Social media has changed the way business is done clearly forever. And because today anybody who has an idea, you know, I invariably say what I do every morning is I look in my closet and I say what's not here and I go to work and make it. But you, everybody, you look out there, what, do, what is missing in your life? And there, you don't have to, in virtual retail, is you have the ability to reach millions of people everywhere immediately. It's just the, the landscape has changed. The cost of doing business has, has never been, it, it's essentially insignificant if you can identify your needs and then you can reach your target audience and you have the ability to identify the market and then identify demand and then create supply, which was never possible before absent of, of uh, a physical, without a physical environment. And you can do it everywhere in the world, no matter where you are, and the boundaries have all gone, and uh, the traditional ways of doing business are questionably a burden, burdensome, let alone relevant. The, the, um, the one thing I, I wanted to say, just to highlight what the participation of William and Zina Pierce. The one thing that drives me in order is 99 and a half. I guess that's more than one word, but it's close. That is, we are 
I spent $3 billion of the American people's tax money to finish the sequencing of the human genome. When that happened, when that happened, we learned that all people on planet Earth were 99.5% the same. And therefore, that every difference you can see here among us, gender, body type, skin type, eye shapes, you name it, everything you can see is rooted in one half of 1% of our genome. Every non-age related difference you can see is rooted in that. And to some extent, so are the age related differences because they grow out of our genetic profile. We spend, most of us, 99.5% of our lives we're thinking about the half a percent of us that's different. Otherwise, guys like Cole couldn't make a fortune selling clothes and <laughs> accessories. It, it's okay. But what you're here to do is spend just a little more than half a cent of your life thinking about everybody else and how you're tied to them. I mean, it, it, when I look at Zainab, because I'm older, I think not only how brave she was and how brave the young man she married was. And I think about how many there were like her that were still left in Iraq or in rural Iran or God only knows where else. When I listen to William's story, I wonder, just in the last hundred years, never mind history, how many there were like him in Africa that were left behind. When I see all these kids in America being shipped off to jail, we got too many people in prison and not enough people being given away out. I wonder how many of them are smarter than I am. That's what I think about all the time. And it's a very useful construct. I grew up, uh, when I was born after World War II, my state had an income only about half the national average. Almost nobody finished high school, much less went to college, except the doctor. The problem is the man running the local car repair shop might be just as smart as the doctor because there was no meritocracy, there was no order, there was no reaching the brass ring. That's what I want you to think about. I want you to think, of, if you want to build a future of shared prosperity and shared community, you can never forget that the 99.5% has to count more with you than the half a percent. You should enjoy the half a percent. Be proud of what's different about you. Well, it keeps life from being terminally boring. <laughs> but don't forget the 99.5%. Thank you very much. Thank you.